church. Today's story is one you may well know, but it's a really important, there's a really important lesson that we need to make sure we understand. It. Let's get started. These guys are all friends. They've been friends for years and right now they're chatting about some guy they've heard about who seems to be going around all the towns in their area, which is Galilee. He's been healing people and saying some unusual and amazing things about how God wants people to live. But not everyone likes him. Some of the people who are in charge of the towns don't like him. But they think that maybe those guys just don't want to lose the important places they have in society. Suddenly, their other friend appears. Guys, he's here. Jesus has come to our town. Whoa, this is just what they've been waiting for. You see, one of these friends isn't able to walk. 
which means they haven't been able to travel to see Jesus in the other towns because it would be awfully far to carry him. But this is their opportunity. So simple. Let's just carry them to the house Jesus is visiting, knock on the door and ask if they can see Jesus for a moment. No problem. Oh no, what are we going to do? We can't get near the door. There's too many people. We're stuck. There's no way. Oh yes, there is. Come on, let's take him up on the roof. So off they went. This friend always has a plan. And then the friend started digging up the roof tiles. Soon, they'd made enough of a gap for the next step of the plan. The people inside were totally gobsmacked. This had been a strange enough day with Jesus healing lots of people and saying some things that really made them think. Not to mention the town leaders whispering crossly between themselves. And now, here was their local guy who couldn't walk, coming through the roof. His friends had some nerve. Now Jesus is talking to their friend. Wait for it, I know it, he's going to heal him. But no, he hasn't healed him. He said, your sins are forgiven. And now the town leaders are furious. Only God can forgive sins. Who does this Jesus think he is? But what's that Jesus is saying? Jesus is asking them which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. Well, we all know the answer to that. If he says your sins are forgiven, you can't see anything happen, so he could be bluffing. But now he's saying, so that you know I have authority to forgive sins. And now he's turned back to our friend, get up and walk. And look, our friend's up on his feet. Oh my, I can't believe it. Oh my goodness, what an exciting day. You know what? God really does forgive sins. Forgiving this man's sin was the best gift God could give him, even better than making him walk. When we trust in Jesus, he forgives us for all the things that we do, say or think that aren't right. It's important that we try to live the lives God wants us to live, but it's super important that we remember that God loves us and that when we trust him, he forgives any mistakes we make and he'll never remind us of those things. When he forgives, he actually refuses to remember that wrong thing anymore. switched on this time so we're good to go. Many thanks to Phil and the band for leading us in, in our praise uh, and to Jenny for our, our, our uh, message for the children there. I want to just take a time now to pray as we come before God in prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father we do thank you uh, for your love uh, and we thank you for Jesus who, who took our sin uh, and died in, in our place. Thank you that he conquered death. And thank you that he promises eternal life to all who will, will turn to him in repentance and faith. And Father, we, we do repent of our sin uh, as we've just been, been here. And we're so aware of our sin and our sinfulness. We're, we're so aware of the, the ways in which we let you down in the things that we do or say or think or, or things that we should do and neglect to do. And Father, we ask for forgiveness. And we thank you that you have promised uh, to forgive our, us our sins and to remember them no more. And so we confess those sins to you uh, and, and we rest in that assurance that Jesus has already paid the price for them. Heavenly Father, we do pray for our church this morning. We remember those who are ill. We remember those who are, are discouraged, those who are bereaved. We pray for those who are isolating and unable to come out, those who uh, miss family and friends. We, we pray that you will bless them. We pray for those struggling financially or those whose, whose jobs are uncertain, and we ask you to be with them. Father, please, please encourage them. And Father, we ask you to guide us and, and to lead us as a church as we continue to worship, uh, as we look to the future, as we uh, make plans, as we hear advice from the, the government. We pray that you'll help us to know how best to encourage one another uh, and to worship you and to be the people you want us to be uh, in these strange days. 
Father, we pray for our province. We ask for wisdom for the, the executive and decisions that they make as they, they try to keep us safe uh, and try to prevent the spread of, of the illness that we're uh, facing at the moment. Father, we remember all those working in the NHS, particularly those in our own church fellowship. We pray that you'll bless them and protect them and help them as they seek to help others. Father, we pray for the wider world as well. We, we ask you to bless those working on the development of a vaccine uh, that will uh, help us avoid this illness. And Father, we do remember those nations whose uh, health care is struggling, those who don't have the resources available to us. Uh, we pray that you will bless them. We pray that you will bless those uh, who are suffering in so many lands that we ask you to, to guide their governments and give them wisdom as they uh, seek to deal with the situation. And Father, we remember nations in conflict. We pray for the situation in Yemen and Armenia. And we, we ask for peace. We, we, we ask, Father, that uh, you will prevent people who are already suffering in so many ways from suffering more. And we ask all that you will bless all those who are attempting to intervene and to negotiate for peace. And Father, we pray for your witness, uh, the witness of your people, as all around the world they seek to point people to Jesus, that in the midst of uncertain times, they may lead people to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. We pray that you help us to do that locally here, and we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world as they seek to do the same. So, Father, we thank you again for the opportunity we have to come and worship you this morning, and we pray that you will continue to bless us as, as we uh, continue in worship. We pray for Aaron as he opens your word and pray that you will speak to us clearly and challenge and encourage us as we listen to your voice. So, Father, we ask that as we meet together this morning, we may be encouraged and blessed and you may be glorified uh, as we offer your worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, please stand with us again.
Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be led by such good musicians. And on Wednesday night at the prayer meeting, we were listening to Only a Holy God, and we were listening to Ellie and Clara, their rendition of it. And it's lovely this morning to hear them in person singing it. And we're just looking forward to the next step whenever we can join in and, and sing along. Yeah, but it's, it's great to have so many talented people leading us and using their gifts to God's glory, whether it's these guys here or the people up on the desk eh, and our junior church people. And a big thanks to all of them. We should acknowledge that there is a, a slight extra pressure these days with it going out live online and eh, just the way things are different. So um, a big thanks to everybody who does get involved and makes these mornings happen. We're going to swear at James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verse 1. We're continuing on in our series in, in James, and so far we've been looking, at, and James is, is showing us really what our faith should look like lived out in practice, and it's a very practical, earthy book, and this morning it's another example of how our faith should affect how we live our life. And just as you're, as you're finding James chapter 2, I want to paint a scenario for you. It's Christmas, okay? It's Christmas, and it's a carol service. And this is a, a pre-COVID carol service. There's none of these face masks, no social distancing. We're all sitting together. We're, it's brilliant, and we're totally taking it for granted, and we don't know how amazing it is. But it's a carol service pre-COVID, and the church is, is, is getting full, nearly full. Everybody's getting in. There's a few seats left, and you uh, are very fortunate. You've got the job of being the usher. So you're meeting people at the door and helping them find their seats. And as the church is, is filling up, and you're looking down, there's not many seats, not many seats left. There's maybe a few seats at the front, but Baptists seem to be allergic to the front row, uh, so nobody likes them. There's a few seats at the back, but there's lots of tall people near the back as well, so it's kind of hard to, hard to see, so they're not great seats. There's a few seats in the middle, and they're the premium, they're the, the premium seats, but they're kind of in the middle, and you know, people don't always budge up. Even pre-COVID, we didn't always budge up, and there's a few sort of gaps in the middle, and they're kind of awkward to get to. You have to ask people to, to move along. So that's the, that's the situation, you're the usher. And then in walks through the door, this person who you recognize. You've never met them before, but you recognize them. And I'll let you insert your own person into this scenario. This is someone who you really respect, somebody you really admire, maybe a, a famous person you've always wanted to meet. Maybe it's a famous local celebrity, maybe it's a sports person, I don't know, a, a golfer, picking a sport at random. Um, maybe it's a famous Christian writer, someone who you, you read their works and you really, really admire them and, and I would love to spend time with them. Maybe it's a, a, a very important business person, the CEO of the company you work for, somebody really important. And they walk in and they say, well, I'm, I'm sorry a bit late. And they look and see the seats at the front and they say, I'd rather not sit at the front. Um, you say, have you got any other seats? W where would you put them? Would you just say, oh, there's a seat at the back there. Just, that's easy. Just stick them in there. Or would you make the effort to come down and, and try to get people to budge up and find them a really nice seat in the middle? And secretly, you might quite enjoy that because you'd get to spend a bit more time with them and you'd get to be seen with them and you'd put them in a place where everybody could see this very important person is in our church. Okay, so you, you seat that person. And then a, a few minutes later, in walks another person. This is a, a little old lady and she's walked in off the street and her clothes are a bit a bit shabby. She looks like she's just walking off the street. And if you're honest, she's maybe a bit smelly as well. And she's a bit worse for wear. And she comes in and she says, I'm, I'm sorry about late. Have you any seats? And she looks in and says, I'd rather not sit in the front. Have you anywhere else? Now, be, be honest with yourself. Ask yourself the question. Would you go to the same brother? Would you go into the middle and try to get people to move around and put her right in the middle of the service? Or if there were seats at the back, would you be tempted to think, well, you know what, you can just, just sit, sit in there? Hopefully, we would all give them both exactly the same equal treatment. If we're totally honest with ourselves, if we ask, look at our own hearts, I wonder, would we? W would I? And that's the scenario in James chapter 2, as we read. So let's read James chapter 2, verse 1. And this, is, this is God's word. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, 
while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which is promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And we'll read on a wee bit later on. But we see James lies out this, this scenario, just like the one uh, we've mentioned, where two people come into the, the, the gathering, come into the church assembly. One looks wealthy, looks, looks important, and the other one looks poor and shabby, and how are they treated? And so I want to think this morning about God's heart and his word in a divided world. God's heart and wor- word to a divided world. We hear and see lots about the divisions in, in, in our world today, and it's played out on the news, and it's, it's very notable. What is God's heart, and what is his word? How does he respond to divisions I want us to know just three things about this before we come to think about God's heart and God's word. Three things about this, this passage. The first one, if you look, look in verse 1, my brothers, our brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you hold the faith. And that word partiality, really what James is talking about is, he's really talking about prejudice, treating people differently according to their appearance. Literally, in the Greek, it means treating someone according to their face. So however they present themselves to you, however they look, that's how you treat them. In Romans chapter 2, Paul uses the same word whenever he's talking about the distinction between Jews and Gentiles. So that's a the ethnic a racial divide. And he says in that context, God shows no partiality. It's the same word. So it's in James's context, it's between the rich and and the poor is kind of a class division. But James is saying there should be no partiality. There should be no prejudice of any kind. Whenever, however, we, we don't treat people. If someone comes in and looks important, do we treat them important? If someone comes in and looks poor and less important, do we treat them with less importance? So first of all, James is talking about partiality or some translations in verse 1 called favoritism. And really it's a type of of prejudice, pe- treating people differently according to who they are. And secondly, notice that it's subtle. It's subtle. So James isn't talking about, he's not calling the church out for, for changing their doctrine or changing their, their official practice. It's not that the church have, have formulated this new theology which says the rich people are all going to go to heaven and the poor people are going to be all kicked out of the church. So it's not official doctrine and it's not, it doesn't seem to be an official practice of the church either. Rather, it's more subtle. It seems to just be their kind of um, unthinking actions, just the way they, they, they treat people informally. It's where they, where they seat people. So it's, it's a, a shining a spotlight on how we treat people different to us without thinking about it. I feel like it's our just the assumptions we make about people and how we, how we treat them. So it's a type of, of prejudice. It's subtle. And also notice in verse 1, he introduces, he says, as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. James, if you like, holds the Lord of glory over this passage. And that's an interesting phrase. It's the only time in the New Testament that particular title is given to Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And whenever something's so unique, we need to ask, well, why, why pick that very particular phrase? And it does, James, want to remind us that Jesus, the Lord that we follow, is the Lord of glory. He can also be interpreted as Jesus, the glorious one. He wants to remind us that Jesus is glorious. And remember, James was, was the brother of Jesus. So James knew who, who, what Jesus was like, knew Jesus' upbringing, that Jesus didn't have a glorious upbringing. When Jesus was on earth, was, would he have been seen as the, 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 the rich, wealthy man who comes into the assembly and given the, the best seat? No, Jesus was a, a Galilean carpenter. Jesus was amongst the poor. The Bible tells us that he became poor for our sake. So our Lord, 
the one we follow, was, became poor for us. And yet he becomes the glorious one. And now Jesus, his, his robes far outstrip and outshine the wealthiest person in any church, in James's church or any church today. And James is telling us that we, we follow a, a servant king, one who made himself poor for us and is now glorious. That is our saviour and our Lord. And I think he wants to hold that over this passage, to bear that in mind, who Jesus is. So how does then God respond to whenever he sees favoritism in a church? How does he respond whenever he sees people being treated badly just by virtue of who they are as human beings? Well, first of all, I want us to see that God's heart is love to the lowly. God's heart is love to the lowly. Look at what he says. After outlining this kind of little illustration, this scenario, he says in verse 5, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? He's showing them God's heart is love to the lowly, that he chooses the weak. God chooses the weak. That throughout the entire Bible, God all, this is as God's pattern. He chooses the small and the lowly. He chooses the weak and raises them up. Those are the people he brings into his family. Think of, of, God, of, of God's people in the Old Testament. Who were they? They were slaves in Egypt. They were slaves. They were the ones who were being mistreated because of their, their, their race. And the ones who were being made to, to, to work and being punished. That our, our spiritual, we are the spiritual heirs of, of slaves. God chose people like that to be his people. Think of, of Gideon. Gideon was a, a judge in Israel. He was the, from the, the smallest tribe and the smallest family in the smallest tribe. The, the least of the least. And God raises him up and makes him ruler over, over his people. And whenever he wants to use Gideon, what, how does he use him? With 300 men to defeat an army of Philistines. Think of David. David's brothers all laid out in the line. And God intentionally looks past the ones who look strong, the ones who look noble, the ones who look worthy, and he intentionally chooses the smallest and the weakest, the one not even considered to be worthy to be in the lineup. God chooses the lowly. Think of the, the New Testament church. In, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writing to the people in the church, he says, not many of you were wise, powerful, or noble birth. Think of the disciples fishermen and, and peasants. Those are the people God continually chooses. He chooses the lowly and raises them up. So God has a heart for the lowly. And so we, whenever we then choose the powerful, choose the, 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 those who look impressive over the, the small and the weak, we are, we are, we're not following God's heart. We're dishonoring God's heart. God has a heart for the lowly. And he, he honors the poor. Look at what he says in, in verse 6. He says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they, they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And I think what James is getting at here is that he says, you, you think that by treating the rich well, that it will help you climb the, climb the social ladder. If you cozy up to the ones who look impressive, then maybe they'll do you a favor. And they'll look well on you, whether it's financially or for a job or whatever. But he's saying you're, you're, you're going out of your way to be, be, be nice to the impressive, important ones. And really what you're doing is you aren't honoring them. You're dishonoring the poor. You're dishonoring the poor. God honors the poor. So in, in, in the church and in society in general, in our lives, there's to be no social climbing. We, don't, we aren't to, to cozy up to the people who we think will get us ahead, either in the church or spiritually or, or even um, in materially, in, in job or work or whatever. There is, no, there is to be no ladder at all. We are all on the same play, even playing field. I was recently, uh, a, a friend was telling me about being at a social event. Uh, and they were there and there were lots of other people there who were not more important, but maybe further ahead in the, the, their, their career, higher up the, the social ladder, if you want to say it like that. And these people totally ignored my friend. Uh, they were all there sort of equally, and, and my friend tried to make conversation, tried to chat 
uh, tried to introduce themselves. They got kind of one word answers and the, everybody else just talked to himself and the friend left totally on their own. And James is saying there's to be none of that in the church. That may seem small and trivial, but it reveals our heart. The small and the trivial reveals our heart in, in, in the mundane and how we treat people. Do we make time to talk to people? Do we only make time, make time to talk to the people who are like us? who we think will increase our, our social standing, who we like to be seen with. A few weeks ago, we were looking at Zacchaeus, Jesus walking through Jericho. Jesus makes a beeline for the little man in the tree, the man who everybody else hated, despised, who had to climb a tree to see Jesus. I wonder, do we, whenever we can, have coffee after church on a Sunday, um, and, and work, and, and other place in every social context do we only go to the people who we are comfortable with and people who make us feel good about ourselves do we look for the Zacchaeuses in every situation because God chooses the weak he honors the poor and then secondly God's word gives and requires mercy God's word gives and requires mercy on a diversity James says then it's not just that God's has a heart for the poor and the lowly, but his word explicitly tells us to treat all people equally. In verse 8 it says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. And James then, this, 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 this shouldn't be hard, this isn't, this, this is, it's not unobvious, it's totally obvious. God's word tells us, love your neighbor as yourself. You're to treat people equally. God's word explicitly makes, makes um, provision for, for everybody. In, in Leviticus 19, in the Old Testament laws, it says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap the field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest, but you shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. In verse uh, 13 in Leviticus 19, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. Verse 15, you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. God's word explicitly tells us we are to treat all people equally, love our neighbor just the way we want to be treated ourselves. So God's word, it gives and requires mercy. It extends mercy to us physically, in terms of socially, it tells us to treat everybody the same. But also spiritually, God's word gives mercy to us. Verse 12, he tells them to speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. That is, if we're followers of Jesus, believers in, in Christ, that God has given us the biggest mercy of all. That given us the law of liberty, that we're not treated as under a law that requires us to, to obey and ultimately fail to obey and then be condemned. But God has looks on people like us, people who fail all the time, people who are small and weak. And yet at the very end of this passage in verse 13, he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. That God has given mercy to people like us. That in God's sight, we, we, we didn't deserve it. We, we sin, we mess up. And yet God looks down in mercy towards us, does not treat us as our sins deserve. That Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, became poor for our sake. So if we, if we have been shown such mercy, and if we truly grasp the greatness and the depths of the mercy that God has given to us, God extends mercy to us, well then he also requires mercy from us. Um, he says in verse 9 then, but if you show par partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as trans transgressors. James is saying it's, it's simple. When you treat people differently because of who they are, and whether that's, whether that's treating someone who comes in and looks poor and shabby and sticking them in the corner and putting the important person in the front, or whether it is r racism, whether we, we in our hearts look down on people of different races or creeds or nationalities, whether it's maybe a more subtle socio socioeconomic um, prejudice, 
Do we look at people who dress maybe differently than us? Whether we look at people who have more than us and sort of secretly resent them and think, oh, they're all, all snobs and, 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 look, and hate them. Or whether we look at people who maybe have less than us. And maybe they dress differently than us. They live in different houses. And really, if we're honest, we kind of look down on them and think that your group is somehow superior, somehow how better. James is calling that out and saying, if you do that, it's sin. It's sin. And we, we can't let ourselves off the hook. It's sin. And James anticipates them saying, but it's only a small thing. It's not that big. He says, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you've become transgressor of the law. He's saying you can't divide the law up and say, well, it's only a small thing to give an important person, give that famous golfer a good seat and the little old lady a a bad seat. James saying, no, that's, that's sin. You've broken God's law. You haven't loved your neighbor as yourself. And look at verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. We shouldn't gloss over that verse. We like the second half of that verse. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Sounds great. Lets us off the hook. But James says, if you are people who continually show no mercy to others, you treat people differently because of who they are, and that maybe is different for all of us, whatever prejudice or bias we have. He says, if that is deep in your heart, then maybe you're revealing that you haven't really understood or experienced mercy for yourself. So whether it's looking past people, whether it's gossiping about particular people in the office, laughing at people behind their back, talking a particular people group or type of person down and elevating yourself. Sin, sin. James in verse five says, you've become, when we do this, we become judges with evil thoughts. In America, there was a, a test to see how good judges were at granting bail. It was a big, uh, it's an important decision for a judge whether or not to grant a defendant bail. And they wanted to know how many people that they granted bail to reoffended before their trial. And they, they, so they, they counted that up, and then a computer program was written where you just type in some of the basic facts about these people, and the computer could guess whether or not that person would reoffend. And who do you think was better, the the judges with all their experience seeing the person face to face or the computer program? Turned out the computer program was 25% more effective at guessing whether defendants would recommit or not, or reoffend or not. So even professional judges, when they look at people, get them wrong. And James is saying, we do that all the time. We look at people and judge them on the basis of their appearance or their background or whatever. We become evil judges. So I want to just pause for a second and let the Spirit speak. Maybe in, in your heart, maybe the Spirit is saying to you, convicting you, you know, I'm, I've been convicted in preparation of this as well. Do we treat everybody the same? Or do we treat people according to their face, according to how they appear, or how, according to, to how society tells us we should treat them? Just take a moment of silence to reflect let the spirit speak, and then I'll 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 pray before we sing again. Father, we thank you that mercy does triumph over judgment. We thank you that you do not treat us as our sin as our uh, sins deserve. Lord, we we thank you, as we heard earlier, that Jesus does forgive sin. And yet, Lord, let us not be quick to run past our our, our own uh, prejudices and and the evil judgments in our hearts. We pray that you'd show us, um, reveal to us, Lord, where we go astray. And Father, that we would be a radical people of, of radical love and equality. We treat everybody the same, no matter who they are, no matter what their background. But Lord, we would embrace your love for ourselves and extend that love to others. So we pray, Lord, you continue to work in our heart. Let your spirit work. Let us become more like Jesus, the servant king, in whose name we pray. Amen.
I invite you to stand with us. We're going to respond to God's word um, through the words of what might be a new song to you. It's called um, His Mercy is More. So I invite you to, invite you to stand with us as we, as we sing through this one. Revelation chapter 6, this vision of heaven and the, the, the multitudes in heaven. 
before the throne of God. And this is their song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you made them a kingdom and priests to your God, and they shall reign on the earth. And their song is, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for your mercy to us and help us to be your people of God, that we would serve you well and serve you in love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just a few announcements before, we, before you go, before you run off. Uh, this week, our home groups are resuming for the home groups that, that, that wish to resume. Uh, so if, if you're uh, not part of a home group and would like to be, then speak to myself or, or speak to Alistair uh, after the service, or if you're, if you're watching online, do get in touch. Christ in Conversation, our evening uh, service is on tonight at 7 p.m., and Dr. Paul Coulter will be with us, and he, addressing the question, is Christi Christianity harmful? And thinking about all, what, all of what society says about, about faith and about Christianity and its, its effects, and he'll be thinking about things like sexuality and, and gender. And then just one fi final thing to mention, uh, the shoebox appeal is happening this year, um, but it's happening online. So if you Google Samaritan's Purse and find the website, you'll, you'll find how to, to, to help out this year um, on the website. That's all our announcements. God bless. Mm -hmm.